welcome to Montreal Rocks. And today I have a band that I've been listening to almost nonstop, Soft Kills. We have with us Tobias Grave. Now Soft Kills is a band from Portland, Oregon. They have over 110,000 monthly listeners on Spotify. I believe one of the reasons is because they're on 50 playlists. I just counted 50 playlists on Spotify. So Whoa. when you hear like a dark wave or a goth or something like that or post-punk, all of a sudden you'll hear this song and you'll go, oh, wow, this is, there's something there. And I would look, soft kills. And I'm listening to a bunch of songs. They're all good. All of a sudden there's a really good sound comes on. What is that? Soft kills. Time after time, man, you killed it. And you make me look at the title. And then I couldn't help myself. So I bought the vinyl. And I'm the vinyl. Yeah, the yellow one. Now we're locked in. So we can't really classify you as post-punk because that category is way too wide. You're not really goth. That's kind of too narrow. But if we look at the last album, the one behind me, uh, I consider it a little bit like a, a Broadway play with the whole cast of characters. But instead of Broadway, it's Skid Row. So I call you a Skid Row musical. Perfect. <laughs> no, that's really interesting that you say that because uh, I have said this before, but the joke we made that it was the Breakfast Club soundtrack taking place at a methadone clinic. <laughs> um, it's it, it was supposed to feel like a mixtape. It was supposed to feel like a soundtrack. Um, I think once we progressed past our third record, even if we weren't able to execute it, it became a conscious thing that my we understood that my voice was the band. And I don't mean I'm not crapping on the other elements of it. I'm just saying that we could make any kind of music we wanted to, any kind of song in that my voice would pull it together since that was kind of the signature thing for the band. Um, I don't think we really executed that till this record. So we were able to pull influences uh, kind of all over the place. Well, before we get started, because I really want to talk about some of the elements of the record, but I always like to start with the origin story. I want to know who Tobias is. I want to find out like where you started. So uh, there's always a uh, I want to picture, you know, maybe you can picture yourself as a young child. Uh, you're listening to, you know, you got music playing in the speakers, maybe in the car, uh, maybe as your parents driving around. Is there a band or a song that all of a sudden hit you differently and music went from something you heard to something you felt? So I grew, I grew up in a musical family. What I mean by that was that my father and his brother both worked as roadies for bands. My dad was a front of house engineer and my, my uncle was a guitar tech. So I grew up overexposed to Aerosmith in particular because <laughs> the, that was the band that they both worked for. And uh, in a way became kind of desensitized and numb to most of that stuff, the traditional rock stuff that was happening. The first band that really was important to me would have been Metallica. Um, I am just of that age. I'm 39 years old. Um, I went and saw Injustice for All that tour. They had a crazy stage. It was theatrical in the ways that was like Kiss was interesting to me, even though I didn't really know anything or have any attachment to Kiss's songs. I thought they looked cool. Um, but there was an intensity to the music that was pretty interesting. And I give them props just because bands that they covered like the misfits and things of that nature, like really started to pull me down the path that became my home, you know? So probably Metallica, but also a lot of eighties, just what was on MTV at that time, you know, psychedelic furs and uh, the soundtracks of, of all those movies that was, constantly playing at the same time kind of boring into my subconscious those john hughes movies were the soundtrack of of many of our of our early exposure to like echo and the bunnyman and the, uh, which got us into the chameleons and 
and psychedelic furs and there's so many bands that uh, were amazing back then which i we can kind of hear in your as an homage in your your stuff right and i think what it what it definitely did what it definitely bored into my subconscious was that i always associated music with like a cinematic edge so i always pictured a scene from a movie since there's kind of a a, a a normal scripted flow to most 80s, you know, movies that we all watched. And I would go, this song is the, this is the song where the person like realizes how they really feel. Or this song is the montage song where we tell the next six months in two and a half minutes. Um, and that's still my- Or the boom box over the head song. Exactly, like there's these moments that I still look at music in that same way, especially when we're approaching the band and, and putting together albums. It's like, where is this going? Like what part of the movie that doesn't exist is this, you know? Um, but yeah, all of that stuff kind of combined together. But Metallica for sure was my first like, I had a rat tail and I was <laughs> wearing a denim jacket, you know? <laughs> I will admit I did have a rat tail for a small period of time and I just could not grow for long enough to make it look good. But no, I, I do want to talk about uh, you went from, you know, I guess being exposed to music to starting a band uh, before soft kills. You were in a blusher grave. Uh, if I said that right. Uh, what did you learn from that band that you can carry over into soft kill? Uh I, so first of all, it's kind of, uh, I think technically the, the, the pronunciation of that band name is Bleu Grave. I- Oh, c'est français. <laughs> right, and I called it Bleu Grave um, because it was on the flip down visor in American made cars. Oh, just say. Bleu yes, Grave. Seri yeah, serious injury or Bleu Grave. And I said, that sounds like a goth band, you know? And we were trying to, <laughs> be like a gothy punk band or I was. Um, the main difference, they are technically in the story arc of my life, artistically, the same band. So uh, Blizzard Grave was 2008. In 2010, I got asked to do an album on a label based out of Portland. Um, I agreed and the ups and downs and tumultuous kind of existence that I was stuck in due to drugs and other stuff. Um, that segued to where the kind of people that I built up to play the songs that I had been writing and then also songs that we were like collaborating on together, it just felt like a new thing. So we renamed it Soft Kill, literally last second like we i remember sitting at dinner with the person putting out the record or at breakfast before we went into the studio for the first day and going so uh decided to do uh maybe have this be a different band which it's kind of a rocky conversation to throw into the mix and he was super receptive and was like oh yeah it's a great idea i love it and we were like oh weird okay that went good um really pleasure grave is like was very lo-fi I was doing all of those recordings at home. Um, it was during a wave of music where uh, bands could record on an eight track that they bought from Guitar Center for a couple hundred dollars, put it directly onto MySpace music. Labels would write you and ask to put your stuff out. Blogs like Fader and Vice and Stereo Gum and whatnot would write about your music without somebody paying a publicist. It, uh, for somebody such as myself, that's always like very unrealistically believed that I can accomplish anything that I try, which has been the result of most of my failures and some of my successes. Um, that really reinforced that it was like kind of an exciting little world to be in, you know, um, but soft kill, we just locked into somebody that thought that paying the money that was needed to record the first album was a necessity. And I got to see like, oh, produced and in a studio through the filter of somebody else's vision of what I'm making, you get something 
much different. I think more powerful and impactful as subjective as that might be. So soft kill has always kind of been like the more polished, realized version, even though I do do some lo-fi demo stuff or will release songs that we don't think need to be re-recorded the way that they are. Of course, you know? now you're, you're, you're back to being independent and really controlling everything all the way down to the merch and all that. But I, I want to talk about your, um, your, your arc, your, your uh, origin story arc. So at one point uh, you record a uh, savior with uh, which uh, dealt with uh, Dominic, your son, that whole experience in the hospital uh, yeah. a long time ago. As you look back on that album, what are some of the feelings that well up? God, uh, Savior, Savior is interesting because it also touches on something you talked about a couple moments ago in terms of it, it really like sets the foundation for us being able to do Dead Kids because when my son was in the hospital and I recorded the first, I wrote and recorded the first song in the hospital room that my partner Nicole was recovering in because she had an emergency C-section. Uh, she almost passed away as well. And it was a, it was just a pretty brutal experience. So we were, we had no money. We were randomly in Sacramento and I had my you laptop. You were on the verge of losing everything, everything. A hundred percent. And I was a very small blip of sober, even from, a, from things like weed and whatnot. So I was, in this, I, I was really hitting me full force for the first time in my life. Um, I look back on it. I remember that I really felt like I was being punished for a lot of uh, the mistakes that I'd made, how I treated my family, um, people that I was close with and whatnot, uh, that my drug addiction and, and that that lifestyle had really um, controlled the narrative of like literally everything and people that came in came into uh into my life um but really what that record's about and what it wells up in in my brain is it was just a real coming to god moment like i was really saying for the first time i was looking in a mirror and i was seeing somebody that was so terribly scared to get clean um somebody who had really never fully come to grips with addiction um that's yeah i think it's kind of misconstrued because the the record is brought on by my kid there's very little about it that's about him it's very yeah. autobiographical you know it's really and when i wrote those songs i remember hearing kind of the way that they flowed and saying well these are definitely not soft kill songs um and then pretty quickly uh because with Choke being like fairly collaborative, like half of that record we kind of wrote as a band or at least Conrad and myself and our our old bass player, Owen, I was like, I don't want to just hand them a record, you know? So this is something else. I'll do this on my own. But those songs were so different and unique. And we started being like, hey, this is the band. This is Soft Kill. This is the direction that it's going in. Um, I would say that I would sum it up as fear. I was really scared. I think back on that time and what I, I was scared in one capacity to lose my, my son and to lose my partner. But I was also scared because I just really realized that like, even if both of those things survived, what was I able to offer and provide for them? Mm. And that was just, it's something that some people come to grips with before they have a plate like that. You know, I got it pretty like thrown <laughs> right in my face. And of course, <laughs> to to go through that is all about taking control from the substance that was controlling you and your actions and now your actions are your own and you once said my kid is a wall between me and bad decisions yeah that's 100 percent true um first of all my kid is a lot of work he's four years old he's incredibly healthy he's incredibly smart he's incredibly manipulative and he's full of energy <laughs> so if i even had the energy to go get relapse and go off the deep end god i would probably need like a two-week grace period of just doing nothing to gain that power because he's he's so draining but more than that 
what I really meant by that is like my I look at my son and I see myself at six or seven really needing my father uh, and my dad being out there doing what he had to do working um but it was deeper than that you know and i'm and, and he and i are close so i don't i don't i know that out of context some things can be misconstrued but i'm just like of of a lot of kids i was a latchkey kid i'm from a broken home my parents split at a time that i was very aware of what was happening and uh they both made very selfish decisions uh that kind of shaped what my relationships with them were gonna be like for the years to follow. Um, I don't want my son to go through that. I don't want him to ever question his mom or question me. Um, you just lose a lot of time, you know, cause eventually if you're lucky enough, like I am to be able to rebuild with your parents, you go, oh man, we could have just been doing this the whole time, you know? Yeah, it's, it's important. This brings us to Dead Kids, Rip City. Uh, it shines a light on addiction, which you had to conquer, and the lives of those it claimed during that dozen or so years in and around 82nd Avenue. Uh, let's look at one story, uh, just because we don't have time to look at all of them, but uh, let's talk about uh, Zachary DeLong and the inspiration for Pretty Face. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that story. That's probably one of the songs that you're going to find that's going to hit you when you listen to those playlists. You'll hear Pretty Face and you go, what is that? That's I think that was my first uh, introduction. Yeah, pretty, pretty face. Uh, I've been, I have personally, let me just preface by saying, I've personally been really excited to see that that's become one of our popular songs. Um, that song's so meaningful. It's the reason that Dead Kids exists. Uh, I was laying on a couch. Um, my, my, my partner, Nicole, looked over at me and she said, hey, your friend, so he used to be a graffiti artist named Lamer. He goes, your friend Lamer, is that Zachary DeLong? I go, yes. And he goes, he just died. And I remember diving off, jumping off of the couch and screaming, what? And just immediately falling to pieces internally, walking into a room and uh, creating Pretty Face. Uh, Owen, who used to be in the band, was there. And we, we wrote that song. Um, Zach DeLong is somebody that I met in 2011. Um, we ended up in the same room because I went on a date with a girl. Um, and she and I were both, I mean, anybody that was getting kind of drawn to me during that time probably had a substance <laughs> abuse issue. Uh, and I show up and see her and then we go to her house and we walk in and this person, Zach, who I've met once before is there with his girlfriend. And I'm like, whoa, what? Like we're in a studio apartment. There's the four of us. It quickly goes from being a date to the four of us going out and spending the entire night uh, smoking crack on the streets of Portland and downtown in the area that is used to be really considered at Skid Row, which is like 6th and Flanders, 6th and Everett, all down Broadway on the on the west side. And he and I, he, I remember like we, we had that night and I was spent paying for the whole night. I probably spent five, $600. Uh, and then the next day he goes, how do you have that much money? And I introduced him to some of, some of the criminal activities that I was taking place in, which was a lot of hitting stores and selling it to specific people and and he and i went on this really it was a very heavy criminal spree uh but there was a lot of moments of like us on the edge of abandon very close um and i talk about this a lot that that i know that people from the outside looking in go oh two junkies out of control the, I said this the other day to some friends, the veil gets lifted. You really see people for who they are. You see somebody at the core of their addiction, which mm -hmm. is all consuming. But I got to see Zach in a light where there was like no hustle or lie or story that could be told. You know, like I was his, I was connected to him by rope. We could hang each other. We could keep each other afloat. There was many different ways that it could go. And 
Um, I ended up getting locked up um, and going to prison. And then when I came home, he was in prison in a different state. And we kept trying to link back up. We stayed in touch. We talked all the time. He was going in and out. And uh, when he came home, I thought he was clean. And I was at a cool point because I remember the last conversation we had was when Dominic was in the hospital. And it wasn't the last conversation, but it was close to it. And it was just like, yo, he goes, when am I going to meet my nephew? And I was like, he's ready. And I was excited because I thought, even though I had no real grasp on sobriety, that I was going to be able to surround my child with like all of these broken, tormented, brilliant artists. Zach is a brilliant artist. Um, and under a different light, in a light that wasn't dangerous. And, and losing him created a massive hole. It also was the song that inspired me going to rehab and getting clean. And it also inspired the concept of Dead Kids. So Zach is Dead Kids. Dead Kids is about a lot of people, but he is the core of that album. And of course, there's a saying that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with and you don't bring other people up everybody levels you down so you have to be yeah. very careful about who you surround yourself especially i would assume when you're uh, getting out of addiction because if you start hanging out the same old friends you're going to go back to those same habits it's inevitable Ab absolutely and and as true as that is at that time we were both at the bottom and we somehow lifted each other up where even though we were actively on heroin at that time um i think we kept each other alive i mean i i beat zach back into life during an overdose like we were that hmm. intertwined with each other and i don't think either i think both of us would be dead had we maybe not met each other in that moment i like to think that that block of time um that we kept each other alive so the, and, and it's just that's a big crazy thing i met person who did the logo above like above the picture of the girls mm -hmm. uh my boy rue rue ran with zach on the streets at a different time i know rue because we both knew zach how that all aligned and came together was like fate it was really beautiful rue did all the art for the album um it's been really exciting building a relationship with specific people that I didn't know when Zach was alive, but who the fact that Zach, Zach only let specific people close to him. So if you were close with Zach and you have Zach stories, then there's a good chance that like you've been vouched for. Mm -hmm. So I've been able to build good relationships with other people who were clean and sober, uh, who weren't back in the day and but, do that. So when you tell these stories and you bring them to light, does it release some of the darkness? Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's uh, you know what's really strange is I when I talk about this genre of music and I talk about a lot of the bands that are influential, I don't know really what a lot of these bands are even talking about. <laughs> so much of it is, feels very meaningless. Uh, Clearly it's subjective. I wasn't there like, you know, when when specific songs are written by specific bands, I'm not gonna call anybody out, but I didn't feel like, I had to kind of make my own meaning for things, which is how you make brilliant songs anyways, right? Yeah. But I, growing up in punk, I always thought like the more visceral in your face presentation of what stuff is was really impactful. Um, like I was listening to, there's a band from Indianapolis called Zero Boys from the eighties and they have a song, Amphetamine Addiction. And it's like Amphetamine Addiction. And I'm like, okay, I get what this is about. You know what I mean? <laughs> whether, whether they were or not, this yeah. is what this song is about. Um, to me, it's like, I pride the fact that we present a raw, potentially even offensive glimpse into a reality that I don't think should just be summed up empathetically through like Instagram, Instagram reposts, you know, like, oh, give a coat to somebody that's homeless um, or 
kind of just put in the peripheral and and have the blinders up like it's hard for me to navigate through the world um being inc not incredibly optimistic but being like incredibly politically correct at times because i know how a great contingent of the world is living and what mm. they're going through and I knew what it was like to kind of come back in in terms of being full of that darkness and trying to talk about my life to people that hadn't lived it. And they were like, this guy's out of his mind, you know, <laughs> not because I was had insane opinions. I just my life experiences were were so on the edge of abandon and insanity that it was like, but they were normal. They were nothing was unique about it. I interacted with 100 people a day that were that screwed up you know so it's it's weird it's like i'm not necessarily just releasing my internal darkness what i'm trying to do is like shine a light on darkness that still exists yeah and, and you're kind of giving us a glimpse like we're looking through a windshield uh, in a safe place of what's out there maybe the car is parked on those a couple of those corners and we see the stories as they unfold and we kind of see what happens at the end of it but we are somewhat re removed from it because we are safe we're we're just listeners uh, we're not participants but it, it is important to to show uh, what's going on and and what the consequences could be uh, right. this kind of brings me to the kind of your your name oh you maybe don't agree no 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 i agree i was saying like uh yeah, it's it's uh no, you're right. You're totally right. I don't I don't disagree. I thought I had something kind of to add to that, but oh, no problem. Um, well, I, yeah. I was thinking about your name, Soft Kill. It comes from the divide and conquer tactic in war, and yes. when it came to addiction, can I just say that that's the first? You're the first person who's gotten that, and that everybody else has been like, "Are you like an like a Alex Jones fan?" And I'm like, <laughs> "What?" And they're like, "You know, like Soft Kill, like they're putting the." chemicals in the air and i go i promise you that's not how we got that name so hey, kudos to you 10 I, points i like to do my research so i want to take that divide and conquer tactic and apply to your addiction how did you divide and conquer that it was something that just that you maybe can help others so a, a, a safe thing a safe starting point with addiction when I talk to people is that the take the drug out of it. So it is there's so many people that purely from a scientific level think about the physical dependency of a person in a drug, right? I could have I thought that all, all the time. I thought like I'm addicted to heroin, I'd get locked up, I'd sit in like county jail for three weeks. I'd get out. I was technically no longer physically dependent on the drug, but I went, went right back to it. So there is this in Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous, those kind of rooms, which work for a lot of people. They're, they're part of my story. Um, I don't force the concept on people, but uh, they talk about like free from the obsession of use. So that's the big thing for me is like what trapped me and suffocated me was that I was obsessed with the use. So nothing else was important to me. There would be uh, getting these demos wrapped up for this next album and doing this interview right here and doing other things. All of those things would feel like obstacles if I was still using because literally all I wanted to do was use, right? Like that, that becomes this thing. So your world and your box becomes so small it's simultaneously a very safe place because i don't have to explore my traumas uh my resentments my insecurities um so you're not doing any self-work so what the big thing for me and this is what crushes a lot of people is that they get clean and they face a world that like they don't necessarily feel very prepared to deal with and resolve the issues that existed before they got sober um be it issues at home lack of support uh being molested a lot of stuff that i can relate with um it's that kind of thing so for me i had to say to myself i am ready to feel the world 
I'm mm-hmm. ready to deal and process through it. I always say this point. This was a big thing for me, and this is incredibly important. There comes the time where no matter how much you do, you never get past a certain point of high and that you never feel something new. And the second it clicked to me that I realized that I wasn't going to like stick a needle in my arm or put a pipe to my mouth that was going to give me a different experience and experiences that I had already felt, I kind of went mad. I went, what? This is it. We've hit a ceiling and I'm at the end of a road. And that's a big thing. There is no high that you, there's no, by the time you're, you fried all your dopamine receptors and you're, you're cooked, there's no place you go to. It's literally the same place. It's the same place. And it is this like, it's like, you're basically a mouse in a cage and that's where you're trapped with it there's no new day there's no new feeling uh and for somebody like me that's you know self-absorbed enough that that seemed really troubling of a reality to be stuck in um it was time to snap out of it i had a literal look to the sky and say please help me whatever is there please I'm at that point and uh, I just lucked out too. I'd never gone to rehab as punishment from court. I never went the other times people tried to send me and drag me there. I went when I was truly ready because I hadn't felt anything else. Uh-huh. And, I, and I went in like a ball of fury. I went in so fried and so cooked that I came to days later and was and I felt incredibly safe in this place that all that was really required of me is to start doing a little better, you know, one day at a time. Um, it worked for me. You know, what's sad is that some musicians feel that they can't create unless they lose themselves to some sort of addiction. Yeah, that's, I hear that all the time. I thought that too. I thought that crystal meth in particular uh, gave me an incredible ability to harness melodies and sounds that I had not, wouldn't be able to, to grab sober. And, in, and to be perfectly honest with you, and I say this, my, my, my wife who's got 11 years clean would slap me in the face. It's true. There are certain places that you go to on certain drugs that you don't go to clean. I just don't need to write those songs anymore. I have plenty of those recordings. And I look at them and I go, whew, there they are. And I can feel what it felt like to make it. You know what I mean? There's, there's certain songs like the whole Premium Drifter record, which is demos. Songs like Build Your Prison Walls, um, I Left You Hanging. I am like so far gone that I get these little glimpses to go back. Uh, What's say, interesting is wow. that soft kills are the, this latest one the rip uh, rip city uh, you said that it, it, dead kids rip city right so you said that yeah. that's the most you felt it was really you so in in essence yes in in a way it does it can maybe help bring these weird sounds or these different sounds but then again you're now doing you and i think that's why it's connecting way more uh, because yeah, it, yeah, Dead Kids is our be- is is I I would say undisputedly our best record, um, in terms of songwriting and and realized, uh, realized vision. Um, it's not just that it was recorded the best. Um, I'm completely sober for those songs. I wrote those songs clean. Um, I am incredibly proud of that and i totally called my own bluff that i couldn't do it without drugs um so now there's no turning back you know (laughs) it's like there it is and it it does feel like me i mean there's nothing about that record that i would change which i can't say that about any of the other records especially some in particular you know so i'm sure there's another million stories you could tell and people also like to share their stories when they meet you at shows you're very accessible apparently do you have a story in particular that maybe gives you goosebumps or blows you away that maybe you heard somebody express themselves 
that somebody has told to me. Yeah. Not I've had a, I've had so many people come up to me that said, I was literally on death's door and I found your guys's record and I felt for the first time that somebody understood what seems so uniquely broken about me and that it has pushed me to do to go to rehab or to do this or to do that or to be better um that's cool i i i the reason that's powerful to me and it's another thing to add to the kind of concept of addiction is that addiction like really robs you of your uniqueness it really brings you to a place of like like I'm my disease and the disease is a, is a literal disease. Uh -huh. And if you've got it and I've got it, Hey, we're our disease. So I love when people realize that what they think is uniquely wrong with them is not unique and that there is uh, the ability to be, become enlightened about it and have understanding about it um, and so on and so forth. That's beautiful. Um, and definitely not definitely something that I didn't grasp till way later. But of course, I was only really in my own head. So I had, you know, my wife, who's got 11 years, like saying to me, I was like this, too. And I'm like, no, you weren't. I'm worse and different and bad in a different way. And you don't get it, you know. Um, so, yeah, people, people, people letting us know that anything that we've created was impactful as they go on that journey of self-discovery and hopefully overcome addiction is, is like a gift far beyond anything monetary or whatever that we've gained from this. Definitely a worthwhile goal. Well, that was a pretty heavy discussion. So let's just flip it around and make it a little bit fun just to end. Um, got two last things that I want to talk to you about. One is just a fun question. If you can keep one tattoo only, which one would it be and why? None of them. <laughs> um, if I had to have one, uh, you're only allowed to keep maybe, one. Maybe I would keep the the lamer, which is Zach DeLong's tagger name on my hand. I'd keep that. Just a little reminder, because I was he's my right hand. Um, the rest can go. Okay. Get rid of. Them. So I'm a I'm not a sports fan so much as a music fan. And you've probably heard of fantasy football, fantasy hockey for us Canadians. Um, yeah. I like to play a game called fantasy rock band. So I want oh. you to create the ultimate rock band guitarist, singer, bassist, and drummer, and see who we can come up with, dead or alive. Wow. Okay. I would take... I would just like build the stone roses. But no, if I had to really dig and put it together. I would take John McGow. Um, actually, I realized that his name is like John McGowick or something. Uh, he played in magazines, Susie and the Banshees, Public Image Limited. He's he's like the pivotal guitar player for me of like shifting to something different. Um, I would take, uh, I would take Ian Brown from the Stone Roses, just I love his voice. I love that it's, I love that it's flawed, you know, um, I would take, um, uh, God, this is hard. You know what? Maybe I would, can I build a five piece? Yeah. We, we need okay. synths or something. I don't know. Uh, let's or two see, guitars. Like, let's do the dual guitaring of John McGowick or whatever. Robin Guthrie from Cocteau Twins. Like, let's see Ooh. what they can meld together. Ian Brown on vocals. Um, bass playing. Maybe. God, dude, there's so many like perfect bass players. Um, who was the drum? Who's the guy that played drums for The Cure for the top? Barry Adamson. Was that his name? Um, you can Google it. Yeah, I'm going to Google it. He was, um, I love his playing style. It's like very brutal. No, let's take, let's take uh, Homeboy from Killing Joke. Let's put him on drums. Okay. Uh, Big John or whatever. And then um, screw it. Let's, let's just like be typical 
and throw uh, Simon Gallup on base. I think that that would be a pretty remarkable band. You know, you'd be able to cover a lot of ground. Those are all the elements I love. I love like tribal drumming. I love like interesting bass lines. I love the blend. This is one of the reasons I love chameleons. You know, the, mm-hmm. the Reg, Reg's and, Reg and Dave's like the dreamy with the gritty. That's a big part of soft kill sound. That's totally coincidental. But then we went, oh, this is why we are doing this. You know, clearly it's chameleons. My, my end game for asking that question is really to find out who your influences are without asking the question and but getting a little bit you know creative in it and 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 that would be a band i would go see definitely it's all in my wheelhouse of of stuff Woo! that i'm liking yeah i would lose my mind that would be a great bit y'all should do it wait <laughs> oh john's john mcgoic is is dead okay well they could hologram him yeah Anyway, Tobias, great conversation. I, I truly thank you for opening up and really getting, giving us a good glimpse of not only your uh, backstory and how you got to this point, uh, but that courage that you had to face all those events and really take control uh, is inspiring. And uh, we can definitely see it in the music. Uh, it's, it's, it's a fantastic album. I listen to it so, so much. And uh, I look forward to what's up, what's coming next. It's, it's bound to be uh, interesting, to say the least. I, I appreciate you and, and taking interest in it and kind of pinpointing what I think is important about it. So that's, that's good. 